So I'm Jim Shames. I'm the health officer for Jackson County. And, you know, things are moving very quickly in terms of this COVID disease that we're all dealing with. And I thought it might be helpful to do an update and basically present what we think we know now, September 2020, in relation to the disease. And I'm going to try and cover a pretty broad spectrum of, of information, and hopefully you'll find it useful. So as I said, this is what we think we know about COVID-19. Um, the information comes in pretty fast. I do my best to distill it, uh, but it's quite possible that some things that we think we know now, we learn later, uh, are not quite so true. But I do think it's helpful to, to kind of start with what we, what we have a pretty good sense of. So this virus uh, that's, that's causing us uh, so much sickness is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it causes the disease we're calling COVID-19. It's a coronavirus, so what that means is when you look at this virus through a microscope, it looks like a crown, and that has to do with all these little spikes on the surface. <clears throat> now, the spikes are important for the virus because that's how it gets into the cells of our body. They attach to these uh, special receptors that we have called um, the uh, ACE2 receptors. And the reason that's important is that they're certainly in the respiratory tract, in the lungs and the throat and the nose. And so the virus can get in, attach to those receptors, and then spread throughout the body. Unfortunately, those receptors are also in the heart, they're in the kidneys, they're in our blood vessels. <clears throat> and so this virus can cause lots of damage throughout the body um, not, just, not just the lungs, which is certainly an important area, uh, but other parts as well. So it causes significant disease, and we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of how that disease progresses. First thing, though, is how the virus spreads. And what happens is the virus in your respiratory tract hitches a ride on mucus droplets, the kinds of things that come out of your mouth when you talk, uh, when you laugh, when you sing, and even when you breathe. And so these viral-related droplets will leave somebody who's infectious and go for a short period of time in the air, probably land on the ground three, six, nine feet away. And that's how people get infected. These droplets land on their mucous membranes and then uh, enter into their body. It's possible that some of the virus may actually float in the air in an aerosol. And we're a little unclear on how common that is, but it may be one of the reasons why you're almost always safer out of doors than indoors. Outdoors, breezes and air circulation just take the virus and will carry it away by and large. Also there's sunlight, ultraviolet light, things that can break the virus down. We do know that some people do an awful lot of spreading of the disease, whereas most people don't spread the disease at all. So um, it could be the amount of virus some people carry, it could be how far away they are from you, whether masking is involved, air circulation, lots of things are at play uh, that influence whether or not you're going to transmit the disease to somebody else and whether they're gonna get it. And yes, it's true that inanimate objects uh, can carry the virus, but we think that's pretty rare, that it's usually a person-to-person -person contact rather than uh, surfaces that we touch. Let me give you two examples of, of viral spread. Uh, they're both very well known. They both appeared uh, in the CDC publication, the MNWR. The first was a choir practice. It was indoors. People were all singing, they weren't masked, and they were in close proximity to each other. In this particular choir practice, one person was infectious. And, in the, and in, after the practice was over, 52 other people got sick. And unfortunately, uh, there were fatalities involved in that as well. One person, 87% of the group got COVID. The opposite example is two hairdressers who were infectious while they were cutting people's hair. Um, and, and they didn't know it at the time, but that's how it turned out. Um, due to state law, 
Both hairdressers wore facial coverings and all of their customers wore facial coverings. There were 139 contacts and nobody got COVID. So the disease, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it enters your body through the respiratory mucous membranes. And as I mentioned, it can have effects on various organs in the body. Um, the symptoms for most people are fever, cough, or shortness of breath, but uh, lack of, of taste and smell, fatigue, um, sore throat. Those are, there are many, many symptoms, but the most common, prominent are fever, cough, shortness of breath. However, a lot of people have no symptoms at all. The asymptomatic rate is estimated around 40%, and younger people are much more likely to have no symptoms than older, uh, older individuals. The fatality rate's a little hard to measure. It's probably about one to 2%. To put that in perspective, the influenza mortality rate is estimated at about a 10th of a percent. So this disease is anywhere from 10 times to 20 times more lethal than the flu. The reason it's hard to calculate is uh, we don't know how many people are actually asymptomatic. We don't have an adequate amount of testing to really know everybody who, who might carry the disease. There's people who are under undiagnosed, and then there's a coincidental deaths where COVID isn't, rec isn't recognized. And by the way, one to two percent is about the mortality that was estimated for the flu pandemic of 1918. Who gets sick? and what can we do about it? There are risk factors for people that are gonna get seriously ill. They are age, obesity, diabetes, being immunocompromised, having pre-existing cardiovascular disease, and a number of other chronic illnesses. Generally, you know, people have the cough and the fever and, the, and then the shortness of breath, and it often can progress so that they can often be at their sickest two to three weeks after uh, the onset of symptoms. We do have some treatments, and they, they vary in terms of effectiveness. Uh, remdesivir is an antiviral, and it is somewhat effective if it's given early in the course of the disease. Oxygen, of course, uh, is beneficial throughout the disease. And steroids may be beneficial uh, at the very uh, end of the disease, and we can talk about that in a bit as well. There are lots of complications, aside from shortness of breath, and cough and, and pneumonia, there's clotting disorders. People get deep vein clots, they get pulmonary emboli, they can have strokes, um, they can have um, blood vessel disease that cuts off the circulation to their extremities, organ failure. So this is a potentially serious disease that can affect ultimately uh, all parts of the body and, and sometimes do. Um, there's some treatments that are being explored, um, convalescent serum, immunomodulators. Uh, the, these medications have not proven to be terribly effective yet, uh, but ongoing work is happening. And finally, there's sort of special populations. Children can get a, a unique and, and somewhat rare disorder called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, similar to a disease we've known about for years called Kawasaki's disease. Fortunately, uh, although it is quite serious, it's also quite treatable. And then there are the special populations that have to do with socioeconomic factors. And we'll talk about that in a second, but I just want to tie up the loose ends about the time course of this disease. In the beginning, the virus is replicating, the virus is causing the problem, right? You got a fever, you don't feel good, you have um, you know, you have a cough. At some point, your body fights off the virus. And after about 10 days, you are not infectious anymore. The virus is no longer uh, in your nose and throat. And over time, the virus causes less and less of your symptoms. However, the inflammatory response, your body's outpouring of inflammatory uh, response to the virus, as well as the ongoing damage, is what can really uh, cause problems over time. So back to the socioeconomic and racial disparities. Um, these are very significant for COVID-19. Um, a significantly greater percentage 
of African Americans, Native Americans, uh, Latinx, uh, Pacific Islanders get COVID than do uh, the white population. Uh, the factors are probably access to care, um, that uh, some individuals um, have to work in high risk jobs like meat packing and sales. You know, they don't have the luxury of being able to work from home. They have closer living quarters, multifamily housing. There may be language barriers in terms of, of receiving the information they need. They may be sort of culturally isolated, so to speak. Um, <coughs> prisons, um, people who uh, have uh, low socioeconomic uh, status are more likely to be in prison, and prisons are really dangerous places to be during COVID. They may perceive discriminatory care, therefore they distrust the healthcare system, they may not have adequate nutrition, and then there's all the predisposing risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, which are really uh, much more common uh, in, in poverty uh, situations. So we need, to, we need to be paying particular attention to uh, disadvantaged populations and be sure they're getting the resources that they need. So how do we fight COVID? Well, we have uh, a system in our bodies um, the immune system, which is designed to fight off infection. And you can simplistically think of it as sort of cellular immunity and hum humoral immunity. So we have cells called T cells, which um, roam around and identify uh, foreign material, gobbles them up, and you know, are sort of the first line battle. They communicate to B cells, which are specialized cells that make antibodies, right? There's lots of different kinds of antibodies. So we have different kinds of antibodies that we make to protect us against COVID. What we do know is that the majority of individuals with COVID do make antibodies after they've been infected, but those levels decrease very rapidly over time. The sicker you are, the more likely you are to, to have high amounts of antibody. And as you may have heard, there have been documented cases of reinfection. We think that's probably rare, but we're going to find out more about that as time goes on. This phenomena of reduction in antibodies over time is really not that unusual. And um, it's certainly true for other diseases. And it doesn't mean that we cannot develop an effective vaccine. But you may have heard about it. Um, and it's, it's a phenomenon that, that is true for this disease. So this is kind of a simple graphic way of describing what happens after infection, right? So viral antigen is the protein surface of the virus, and the viral RNA is the genetic material inside the virus. And as you, as you get infected, those levels go up very high, and then over time they fall and disappear. And then if you were to sort of measure over time, the antibodies, IgM and IgG, increase uh, after the virus is gone, right? So it's not helpful to measure antibodies as a way to know if somebody is actively infected with COVID because by the time the antibodies have developed, the virus um, is, is no longer uh, able to infect other people. So each infection has its sort of inherent infectiousness. Some, uh, some diseases are more infectious than others. Influenza, for example, is not considered a, a very highly infectious disease, and measles is extremely infectious. So this inherent infectiousness of a, of a disease is called the R0. So the R0 for COVID-19 is estimated about 2.5. For influenza, it's 1.5. And for measles, it would be 18. What that means is, if you did nothing to try and change the course of the disease, one person with COVID is likely to infect two to three other people before the disease has run its course. Each one of them is likely to infect two to three other people before it runs its course. So this illustration here shows one sick people, if there were an R naught of two, two people would be infected. Each of them would infect two people each of them would infect two people. And you see how the numbers increased very quickly. And that's how a pandemic can spread through a community 
in, in very short order. However, we can change that by our behaviors, right? So if we wear masks, do social distancing, wash our hands, we can reduce that R value, right? We can, we can reduce it down. And in fact, um, currently in, in Oregon, we're estimating that our R value is around one, probably a little less than one. And therefore, every infected person is only infecting one other person. And that, and that would be a plateau. That's where the disease continues, but doesn't increase. If we can get that number down below one, then we can make COVID uh, disappear. So the point is we have within our capability means to reduce the transmissibility of COVID by wearing facial coverings, by keeping our distance, by washing our hands, by being careful in all those ways. And we can bring the uh, transmissibility down until the disease would go away. Um, so another strategy we have has to do with testing. And this is a little bit of a busy slide, but essentially you have two kinds of tests. You have diagnostic tests, like why are, why are you sick? And you have these antibody tests, which basically say whether or not you have previously been infected, right? We have two basic kinds of, of diagnostic tests. We have the molecular tests that measure the actual genetic material in the virus. And the classic one that you've probably heard about is the PCR test. These are done either uh, through the back of the nose into the anterior part of the nose, uh, can be done by saliva. And in general, these are the most accurate tests. Um, generally, they are sent away to an independent lab and the results can take days or sometimes even weeks to come back. Um, although we do have the capability of faster tests, those are more sophisticated, require a more sophisticated lab, and there's the so-called gold standard of our testing. We have, also have access to antigen tests, um, which can be done at point of care. They can be done very quickly. They're usually nasal, but they can also be done on saliva, excuse me, and uh, you can get a result in just a few minutes. And finally, the antibody tests are done on blood, and uh, some, some can actually give you results quickly, and others have to be sent away. But the important, important thing to know is that we have different tests um, for both diagnosis and then we have antibody tests, and they shouldn't be confused because they're really quite, quite different. Let me talk about the test that most people are familiar with. It's called a PCR test. It stands for polymerase chain reaction. And basically what it does is it, it converts the RNA and the virus into DNA. And then it amplifies that DNA over and over and over again, doubling it and doubling it and doubling it and doubling it. And they attach a, a little bit of fluorescence to the material. At some point, you can amplify the genetic material enough that you can detect it and then determine that the person has been exposed to this disease. This test, it detects specific RNA fragments. Um, it doesn't tell you whether the virus is alive or not. So this test is so sensitive that it may be able to uh, detect tiny little pieces of RNA that have been lingering around in your nose for weeks, right? So it's a sensitive test. It is definitely tells you that whether or not you've had the disease, it just doesn't tell you whether you're infectious or how long ago you had the disease. You can do this test either nasopharyngeally, putting a, a swab way back in the nose, or just in the anterior part of the nose, and it can be done by saliva as well. How accurate is this test? It's probably about 90% sensitive and probably about 99% specific. And I'm going to go into that in a little more detail in just a minute. This is a complicated slide. And I want you to pay attention to only two things. One would be the blue line, and the other would be the red line. And you'll notice at the bottom we talk about time, uh, 
time measured in weeks. And you'll see this black dotted line going up uh, vertically on the left side. What this says is that my PCR test um, is highly sensitive shortly after I start developing symptoms and it can detect, it can be positive on week one, week two, week three, week four, week five. It can be positive for a long time. And yet the red line says the virus comes and goes, right? So by early in week two, I don't have any more virus that's living in my respiratory tract. I cannot infect others. And yet the test can be positive for a long time afterwards. And that's important because we often misinterpret the results of a positive test. So what does sensitivity mean? That means the portion of people with the disease who will likely have a positive test, right? So if I have 100 people, I know they've got COVID and I run a test, 10% of those people, 10 out of 100, may come up with a negative test, right? That would be a test that's 90% sensitive and has a 10% false negative reading, right? Nothing is perfect. These tests are not perfect. Antigen tests, remember those point of care tests? They're a little less sensitive, right? They don't, they don't detect um, the disease with as much uh, sensitivity as the PCR test. Specificity, um, that's the proportion of people without the disease who have a negative test result. And we're saying that these tests are about 1% uh, specific. Um, I'm sorry, 99% specific. So therefore, you can say, what are the chances that when I get a positive test, I don't really have COVID? That's about 1%, right? So it's important to understand these are imperfect tests, but um, they're pretty good and certainly good in terms of specificity. There's a lot of issues that have to do with testing. For one thing, we keep having shortages of materials to do the tests. We run out of swabs, we run out of transport media, then we don't have enough testing reagent, not to mention the machines or the PPE required for the people taking the test. And so you add all those up and we are not able to test as much as we probably could. The other thing to understand is that we've been talking about diagnostic testing. I don't feel good, I'm gonna go get a test. Um, testing of people without symptoms probably should only be done in very specific circumstances. And that would be called surveillance testing. So we just had a case in a nursing home, right? We have one sick person, we have 99 people that have no symptoms. We would wanna do surveillance testing. This is a high risk uh, situation. Find out whether people are asymptomatic, identify them quickly, and isolate them from others so the disease doesn't spread. Um, it's, it's a little complicated, but if you have very little disease in your community and you start testing uh, lots of asymptomatic people, chances are a good number of those positive tests you get back are probably gonna be false positives. You know, think of the thousands of athletes being tested before they could play sports and they keep popping up with positive tests and they have no symptoms. I guarantee you some of those tests for false positives just because it's just the statistical nature of, of testing uh, asymptomatic people. Um, we do not recommend a test of cure testing and the reason for that is that slide I showed you a while back. Tests can remain positive for a very long time, long after somebody is actually infectious to others. So once you get sick with COVID, chances are that after 10 days, you are not infectious to others. You may be sick. You may be sick for weeks to months. It doesn't mean you can transmit the disease. Um, so this is a, another one of those sort of complicated slides. Um, but there's a question that's really fairly important from a public health standpoint. We have this very sensitive test, the PCR, which could take days to come back and is, is quite sensitive. But then we have these other tests that are less sensitive, but we can get results immediately. So 
is it better to have a very sensitive test that has a delay in giving the results? Or would it be better to have a less sensitive test that gives you results immediately? Um, I've already said this, that often you can get a positive test and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're infectious to others. So just a concept to understand is that we have the capability of producing large volume, inexpensive tests, such that people could spit on a piece of blotter paper, look for a color change, and, and know right then and there whether or not they're likely to have COVID. And yes, that test may be less sensitive, but what if you did it every day? You know, you received in the mail a month's worth of blotter paper and you just did it and you could make a decision about whether you're gonna to go to school or are they gonna to go to work. Um, you know, we could, we could change the dynamics of this disease around testing, but it would require a really different concept of testing than we, than we currently have. I want to touch about mitigation strategies. Um, hand washing is really important. Uh, go look on YouTube to see how to do it right um, because uh, uh, a lot of us have been washing our hands wrong all these years. Uh, we have a habit of touching our faces, our noses and our mouths. Hopefully I haven't done it this whole talk, but I have the tendency to do it um, as the rest of us do. So, so pay attention to that because it's important, especially when you're out, uh, out and about. Uh, yes, wearing a mask is very important, but if you then touch the mask and then touch your eyes, you may be defeating the purpose. Uh, we talked about how the droplets uh, can, can go from your mouth and then fall to the ground. If you are more than six feet away, you greatly reduce the likelihood of that. Uh, remembering that uh, being indoors is um, a much riskier place to be than outdoors. You might even want to extend your social distancing indoors, especially if you're not wearing a, a facial covering. Um, there's lots of different ways to cover your face. Uh, Multi-layer, tightly, uh, tightly woven uh, cotton is, is really quite effective. Uh, surgical masks are, are good. Uh, we're trying to reserve N95 masks for healthcare professionals, but they are, um, they are uh, more effective. Uh, than, than cloth masks, for example. Um, but the bottom line is masks will definitely help protect others from uh, droplets that are coming from your mouth. And depending on how tightly you fit them to your face, they will protect you from others. If we're all wearing masks when we interact with each other outside our families, um, we can do a tremendous amount to reduce the incidence of this disease. Testing, isolation, uh, and quarantine. The whole concept here is we identify people who have COVID. We find out who their uh, contacts were. We ask those people to quarantine for 14 days. Stay out of circulation. Uh, don't go out of the house unless they absolutely have to. And if they should get sick, they get tested, and then they become a case as well. Um, these are very effective strategies if people will use them. We do have some treatments. And then a vaccine uh, is, is probably coming. It's certainly uh, in, in late stages of development. And to understand vaccines, it's, it's a way in which we trick the body into developing immunity without us having to get sick, right? So we don't have to get measles in order to be protected against measles. And there's lots of different ways that vaccines work. And uh, generally, the testing for a vaccine to bring it from concept to delivery takes years, sometimes decades. Um, and that's because you go through an exploratory phase that takes a couple of years. Then you have to propose in safety. Then you get an application. And then you do small human trials looking for safety, larger human trials, trying to see if there's any efficacy. And then finally, you do what's called a phase three trial, Tens of thousands of people, half of whom get a placebo, half of whom get the virus, get the uh, vaccine, and you put them in, you know, their normal environment and see who gets sick and who doesn't. Uh, so you can see how that would take a really long time. So we are using all the resources at our um, that we have uh, available to try and speed that process up. It doesn't mean 
that we're not going to come up with a safe vaccine, but we're certainly doing lots of things simultaneously and quickly that haven't been done before. And I would say that so far, uh, some of the information that's coming up with vaccine development looks, uh, looks favorable. And I'm encouraged that we, we will have a vaccine, uh, but I, I don't know how long it'll be before it actually gets into the bodies of, of the people that actually need it. I'm sure it's many months away. Uh, there's lots of false information out there. Um, and I, the places I go for information are the CDC website, Oregon Health Authority, uh, the Jackson County website. Uh, if you want to know about testing, you can, you can uh, research uh, through the FDA. Johns Hopkins and World Health Organization have some really excellent um, data visualization for those that want to sort of get a little deeper into it. I receive medical journals, which I read on a regular basis. And I, I know this is a little goofy, but there is a podcast called This Week in Virology. And for those that really want to get into uh, a leisurely nerdy uh, look at, at what we know about, about COVID, I would recommend it. And if you take me up on, on, on this recommendation, check out July 15th, Michael Minna and Anthony Fauci has been on there. And uh, I think that's it. So I hope that was helpful. Um, that's, uh, that's sort of an overview of the information as I as I see it now, I'm sure things will change, and if they change significantly, uh, maybe I'll do this again.